there is a disconnect. The younger crowd, people who didn't succeed at gaming right away, who don't have the luxury of being like, okay, I succeeded, now it's time for me to jump out and create my own intentional community. It's not so easy. We are told this sort of sense-making information. At the same time, it did not feel very on the ground to me. It felt very abstract. What can we do in the interim to get us towards the world that we want to create? If we want game B to work, it needs to, on some level, be more fun, be more rewarding than game A, in a way that'll allow us to have a, just a a more enjoyable relationship with it because if we're having fun we'll want to do it more what we consider menial work is framed differently if that becomes more appealing there is a way in the game b kind of world where i wouldn't mind stocking shelves or helping customers find goods i want to see gratitude built into more of our direct relationships i don't want to never see the face of the person who picks up my garbage for me that's like such an act of service that i want to be able to thank them that's how we build communities by being curious to what everybody does not to judge them on the activities they do but to see who they are as a human. Right, we are recording. Uh, hello, everyone, and this is something a little new. This is the first uh, group session uh, discussion with many amazing people around the sense making community, particularly the Stoa. And uh, I'm here today with my facilitator, co host, uh, Chris D. And uh, basically, what, what happened was I came across a letter that he posted on Stoa Discord called on being in right relationship with productivity and personal development. And it was something that I really resonated with. And I think that uh, a lot of people, especially in this space, I think like, you know, there's this, 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 this resonance, there's this vein running through about how do we navigate this game, especially after COVID hit. And then it's like, okay, we don't have to play this game anymore. We don't have to do game A anymore. So how do we, so what do we do next? How do we transition? Do we go straight into game B? How do we get in right relation? you know, between being productive and with, you know, pursuing personal development, collect development, uh, communitas. So uh, Chris, if you'd like to uh, inform us, like what inspired your article and what were your main uh, takeaways that you wanted people uh, to take away from your article? Yeah, uh, thanks for Albert for bringing me in. Um, I was really interested in how much people were so interested in personal development but also at the same time trying to form community. And I sort of thought there was a sort of connection there where um, because we're doing so much inner work that it also affords the intimacy to be able to then collaborate and to community build and to form a collective story um, mm. in spite of our differences. So it, it definitely, it definitely brought a, another perspective in which we are told this sort of sense-making information but at the same time, it did not feel very on the ground to me. It, it felt very abstract. And so I was trying to respond in a way where what can we do in the interim uh, to sort of then get us towards the world that we want to create? And mm -hmm. it's not that the new world is going to come tomorrow. There's still the process of living every day and trying to get into into coherence. So that's that's where I'm trying to like discover where the inner work fits in, how does trauma fit in, and what is the future for personal development? Yeah, and like uh, another, this is something that I've uh, encountered going in all my different, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess little sojourns into all these different communities around the sense making community, is that I, I did get a lot of comments and th that there is a disconnect, there is a pushback uh, from, uh, you know, certain people, especially like the younger crowd. Uh, I, I, like, I know like the Game B Facebook, it's, there's a lot of millennials there, but there is, it's a certain type of millennials, typically the older millennials and like uh, typically the younger crowd, people who didn't, you know, succeed at gaming right away, who don't have the luxury of being like, okay, I succeeded. Now it's time for me to, to, to jump out and create my own intentional community. It's not so easy, especially for, you know, us still on the ground. And I was actually at a Future Thinkers uh, session, uh, what was it yesterday or the day before? And then um, UV and Mike, they gave out a printout of like how they see Game B playing out. And they said like, oh, oh uh, uh, realistically over the long term, in 70 years from now, we think maybe like 5% of the world will be Game B. 
And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Is, they, you're predicting in 70 years we're five percent about five percent of the human population can be game b is like i mean so what is going to happen is like we said in the interim like how can we transition like we can't just jump from a to b so this is what like i guess kind of wanted to explore in this discussion um so chris i mean uh go ahead i mean like like start like uh uh where do you think we're going how should we get in, in relationship and just let's open it up from there I really think of collective presencing in that we do get the chance to listen to what is actually changing, where that flow of change is happening. I sort of see it in, in like in my circle, it's like spirituality and tech and, and, and fitness as well. So it, it definitely seems like there's, there, ha, there is, there could be some convergence um, and towards how we rethink certain industries. Um, mm. But there's definitely, there's definitely a lot of people like that is not even in this space that think like a game B like, but still have to play by game A's rules. Mm, yeah. So definitely, it was definitely trying to make a sort of like r a routine or a sort of lifestyle that would sort of embrace collaboration, community building, um, mm. forming that collective story, even though we don't necessarily have the resources yet to do something like that. But I see the communities of play, whether they be lighthearted or whether they be serious. We talk about John Verveke's notion of serious play. What can these emerging communities of wisdom activate within us to do? Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, so we can open up here and everyone can just popcorn in if you want. David, uh, Rob, Adam, Wayne, uh, if you would like to give your personal take or your personal story uh, navigating the game, you could go ahead and, and jump in at any time. Check in. Yeah. So kind of what's alive for me right now in this space, I did a little bit of writing prior to coming here because I wanted to just clarify my own thinking is that it's going to be really important to get out into the space and articulation of what we think the game B relationship to, or not the game A relationship to productivity is and the game A framing of personal development is because we need to know where we are right now what we've kind of inherited from our culture what we're used to thinking about what is personal development and what is productivity what do they mean to us we need to know where we are now what we've received from our culture in order to go somewhere else and then we can start mm -hmm. to do something like envision how do we want to redesign the habitual ways in which we think about personal development and productivity. And then the other thing that's really resonating with me that you guys are saying so far is um, I'm 23. I haven't had a chance yet to, to win at game A. So mm, I'm kind of like, yeah. you know, feeling a little screwed by <laughs> the direction the world's heading in. Yeah. And at the same time, I've been, I've been kind of throwing myself full heartedly into traditional game A entrepreneurship. But now I've fallen into this sense making space as well. So I'm starting to kind of try to weave into a new way of thinking about what it means to have a sort of game A win, but also be moving that towards like a game B style of doing entrepreneurship or winning. Mm. So that's where I am. Yeah, that's, it's interesting you, you put it that way, David. I, I really like the, uh, the, questions you raised about our definitions of, of productivity, our definitions of self-development, what we think those things mean, because in a game A framework, those are, those are not easy to um, really make sense of. I, I think about, well, I'm, I'm 33, I uh, came into the, the working world right when the financial crisis had just struck. Mm. And so it's like, you know, great, like welcome to employment, we're in a recession. Um, and looks like Dave, you got a similar path ahead of you right now. Um, so I, I feel you on that. Um, this idea of like what productivity means in a game, a atmosphere is like what you can get paid to do or what someone will call you useful once you've done it. Um, and that kind of just squeezes all of your best capacities into a really narrow field. Um, it tends to negate some of your best qualities if you listen to that voice too much, you know? And so I think it would really reduce both 
your productivity in real terms of like, what will you produce? Um, and I think on the self-development side, it's also going to harm uh, like what you might value about yourself if you're buying into that rubric. So, you know, even, even self-development gets, uh, gets a treatment from game A that's like, um, it needs to feed your productivity or it's not real development. Um, I mean, I, I personally don't buy into either of these cases. I don't think that real productivity is what you get paid to do. I don't think self-development is what makes you more productive. So I'm, I'm curious to hear other people's framings of, of maybe a, a more clear seeing way of defining productivity. I don't think that I don't think that people who are earnestly playing game B will have to use that game or the people playing any game around them in order to define what self-development would look like. They might still do that with productivity because it still is kind of like, well, what are you producing for the community? What are you producing for the relationships you're embedded in? But I think that that will be a lot easier to advance. Well, this is what feels productive to us as a culture. And so whether or not it it has monetary value in our current definition. Um, it still is, you know, of of value. And then hopefully, what what arises from game B is something that can kind of reward you, remunerate those those efforts. Mm. Yeah, uh, great point, Rob. I mean, yes, and Chris, I know you mentioned this in your article, especially with uh, your mindfulness and <laughs> all the all these self help books, you know, to, to, to have us, you know, to, to self basically self medicate us as you know, we, you know, put ourselves in through the grinder. And uh, actually, I mean, uh, what has been spoken so far uh, from like David and Rob is like, uh, actually, this is going to be covered. I'm releasing an episode on Sunday um, from by uh, John G. Root Jr who is like a monetary reform and a, um, an advocate for so the sociocratic form of governance. And he basically goes about it is what happened was this whole mindset, this game A mindset of having to work for a living. This is like, this distorts the whole um, relationship between consumption and production because in a normal uh, uh, dynamic, consumption is supposed to be egoistic, right? You're supposed to be like, okay, you know, I want some food so I can live, you know, I want some shelter so I can, you know, not die, you know, out in the elements. Like you're supposed to be egoistic in your consumption, but in your production, you're supposed to be altruistic nat naturally in an environment where you have your needs, your consumption needs taken care of. You're supposed to be like, okay, I have this taken care of. Now, what do I produce? Oh, you look around in society, it's like, oh, I see, this is what society uh, needs. And then you produce. What happens when the dynamic becomes, oh, I have to work to live. I have to earn my living, right? Not before, you know, I don't have money taking care of me. I have to earn my living. Now your production becomes egoistic. Instead of your production being uh, altruistic naturally because you have your needs taken care of. So that's uh, like a big, that's one of the big, you know, things we have to grapple with. Um, so again, so if Adam, uh, Wayne, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts, uh, if you have anything to share about uh, the relationship between uh, productivity and personal development. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I guess I'm the oldest in the group. <laughs> um, Age is nothing but a number, like me, for example. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'm supposed to change my name here, too. I'm, I, don't, I don't enjoy having my name seen on there. Oh, yeah, um, uh, Peanut. I'll, I'll edit it out, Peanut. Okay. Yeah, yeah, peanut. Um, that's that's a better name. Yeah, for me, um, I put a little quote there for seven days a week. Um, I see a transition as uh, from from what we have from game A, which we hardly even know what it is, um, to to this other game is a transitional event that happens progressively. Um, I sort of see like the collapse of Rome and all these other disasters we have some notion of is that was the ones left over from the collapse of Rome game B. I mean, you know, they wouldn't call themselves game B, but that's exactly what it is. So um, I don't think we actually know it until we're in it. And then when we look back, we can say, yes, we're in a different era. Um, but, you know, I, it, for me, I don't think there's, as you've, described already is that there's any real transition point to say yes I'm there it's just really um, as uh, Buckminster Fuller would say um, the next plan would be seamless we wouldn't we would enjoy it more than the present one um, so that enjoyment would 
um, supersede the struggles that we have. And as you rightly said, um, Albert, with having your needs met, um, that's the first priority uh, to put us in a, in, in a better mental state to be altruistic. Uh, I, I just don't see it any other way. <laughs> uh, so Adam, so if you have any thoughts, I would love to hear them. So what is your personal relationship with uh, personal development and productivity? And like, how do you think that we can go about defining it? And like, what are the difficulties in defining it right now? Yeah, so I'd start out with just, just responding to Peanut really quickly. I think I've heard Jordan Hall use a metaphor before that related to the parting of the Red Sea and how as we make this kind of transition into whatever this next phase of the game is, right over our shoulder, we will still see a lot of game A and probably rely on a lot of those mechanics to help us with that transition. Um, not that we shouldn't be heading away from the just kind of part, part of the course. It's going to be very tough to jump into whatever game B is and however we end up defining that. And uh, broadly take care of on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, taking care of food and shelter. That's going to be hugely difficult to instantly switch to something else, especially for any large mass of people. So it is going to be this transition. Uh, my other my other thought was just kind of re reading through the article that was posted was, I, I know I personally suffer with this a lot, is that when I'm thinking about this personal development, I do a, I, I love the community that's been developed around the Stoa and kind of future thinkers and Game B. And there's a lot of brilliant minds and insights and ideas. I tend to get trapped sometimes because I'm absorbing all this wonderful information. But when it comes to my own productivity, I never kind of integrate that information into my life and actualize it in a sense. So I'm just bombarding myself with a bunch of kind of self-development ideas and theory and kind of like this faux pseudo intellectual uh, pursuit that I have, which is kind of some kind of intellectual masturbation going on for me personally. And I end up av avoiding actually being productive in my own life and moving forward. I can answer that a little bit. Um... It's a, I can mirror everything you said there. Um, for me, it was really um, after, again, re reminding myself that other great people have challenged these notions from being imprisoned or being removed from society or ostracized in a way to actually find a way just to walk out the door and start something new with, um, without any fear. Um, you know, I take like someone like Gandhi's example to just really show a new method to the madness um, and to do it unabated. Uh, so I chose to do the same thing is just really just to go out in the community and so see who's listening um, to whatever worth you have as a value in what you do, whether it's music or creativity. Um, but the main thing is not to fear it. I mean, you know, I, tell, I send my children out with a chalk box and they just go out and draw on the street. Um, it's the best thing to do. Uh, the creativity brings other attractive, attracted people. I, th I think that's like a good jumping point because where I, where I see the sort of direction that people want to go, um, we also have to think in terms of like rivalrous dynamics. So for example, like the smartphone, the smartphone was a revolution that was so more efficient and more powerful than anything that was before it. So that that's why people adopted it. You also had the side effects of what like smartphone use and everything, but we were talking about like a very powerful tool here. And, and so what I'm seeing within the sense making community is that there is these powerful tools of personal development and community building um, to give people something that they've been longing for, for a very long time. So, so my question is, what is the sense-making community doing well and how can we make it more attractive to more people so that we can sort of have a more um, competitive edge to the dynamic uh, that we want in this world? That's what you're saying makes me think that it's, it's kind of like we need to articulate a way to understand productivity and personal development such that 
they're enjoyable. Um, something was said yesterday in a, a voice chat on the Discord that Rob hosted that like if we want game B to work, it needs to like on some level be more fun, be more enjoyable, and be more rewarding than game A. So, Chris, what you're saying is like, what is what does the sense making space have to offer us regarding personal development and productivity? such that they could be more enjoyable, more attractive to, you know, people currently playing game A who maybe are finding that the mainstream approach to habits where it's just like grind it out, grind it out, grind it out. You're going to you know, develop yourself by forming all these habits that you should develop and you're going to grind them out day after day and it's going to suck, but then you're going to have your good habits and then you're going to, you know, have like higher game A status or higher productivity or something. What if we had a way in which we could be productive and we could develop ourselves that was more enjoyable, that was more about playfulness, was more about inner alignment and all these other ideas that are floating around this space. I think that's that's what we need to talk about to start understanding how we can we can frame personal development and productivity in the context of the sense-making space in a way that'll allow us to have a, just a, a more enjoyable relationship with it. Because if we're having fun, we'll want to do it more. And it'll also just be like, a more aligned part of our lives if we we follow what feels right to us into those domains um yeah um if i could just add a little bit to what david said it's like yeah i mean like that this playfulness i think is uh is really important and this is a lot uh that i think this is a sense making space is doing it well certain aspects of it like this is why i was personally drawn to the stoa because like you know i was like oh i saw you know daniel schmachtenberger video with peter Lindbergh at the stoa i was like what the hell is the stoa I click on the video, you got the, you know, like Kali Yuga blues playing, and then you got the Star Wars, this, this, this. And you got all these like hip, as Peter says, these these sexy, good looking people. Uh, I'm not gonna name any names, but you know, I, you know, there were some, you know, there's some good looking people there. And I was like, wow, this is like these are people like me. Like I could like, you know, like again, I'm not gonna name names again, but if you go to some other spaces, they're a little bit uh, very serious, and that's fine. Like you could be serious in some spaces. But, you know, the snow was like, oh, my God, these are my people. And then what I'm trying to do with my own thing, Nordic Nomads, is like, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like taking another step into a more, even more crazier direction. And like, I'm kind of like seeing myself as like a Venn diagram between like kind of the sense making space and maybe a more general audience that is, you know, maybe not so super brainy and cerebral all the time, but is very interested in these ideas. And this is very important, I think, for, for, for branching off. So I'm completely with that. I'm completely for having fun. I know when Rob leads his groups, he always loves to start with games. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. I mean, we, and we talk about psychotechnologies and everyone like Christians throwing out all these psychotechnologies. So yeah, I'm totally with this more playful side to, to game A, which to game, to game P, I should say, which should make it naturally uh, more resonant uh, with, you know, people at large who have to play this super serious game A. Yeah, and anyone can like explore the sort of um, opportunities for fun um, that got them within the sense making community in the first place. Like, I personally think that the sort of opportunities for expression will actually be key to attract people like, like Tyson's freestyle rapping or improv or spoken word or whatever the the art metaversity will afford that and, and have people just just paint for the hell of it and get to get to do drawings that is not really seen uh, out there, but in terms of having a sort of creative commons um, that could be eventually realized. I think that that could be an area that we can go with. Um, do anyone else want to like talk about like possible moments for creativity? Not necessarily a moment for creativity, but I just want to second what's kind of being danced around here is that the collective spaces like the store are providing a sort of like atmosphere of vibes that I feel is really effective for personal development because Adam, you were saying it's like, it's got you interested in a lot of learning and like that, that's a form of personal development. It might just be that you're dancing with the thoughts for now, but that is like a form of growth that is being facilitated by being a member of this collective space. So plus one to all this talk about how uh, an open, playful space like the Stoa that resonates with us is a huge kind of facilitator and catalyzer for personal development. So maybe that is a big aspect of of personal development in Game B too, is that it's it's less of like a siloed individual thing where you're like home alone, grinding away at your habits and your project and stuff like that. It's like a, a shared endeavor and a shared space. Makes me think of Peter's um, 
Stoic Hustle, which was like a morning shared Pomodoro session. We did like two hours of Pomodoros together and had a spreadsheet to kind of track our intent and stuff. And it was good, you know, it kind of kind of gave a different atmosphere to productivity that I think helped me to achieve a little more than I usually do. So plus one to collective spaces for productivity and personal development. Yeah, I mean, definitely I'm all for that. And uh, as you were just uh, referring to before, David, about how like you're kind of <laughs> like, do you consider yourself a Gen Z or, or like a young millennial? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, you're right there, right? So, but I mean, regardless, I mean, you're right there. And like you kind of just entering the workforce, quote unquote, at the, you know, one of the worst opportune times. And like Rob, I entered the workforce right during the last session, the last recession. So that wasn't so good. So I was wondering uh, if anyone wanted to share their personal stories, like navigating the game and like what their kind of uh, story was, what their troubles, what their experience was navigating, you know, game A and in, in, in like how you thought about game B. Like was game B something that you naturally came to after you saw how terrible game A was? Or is this something that you were kind of always into? I just want to know. Uh, if anyone else wanted to share their story about that. Okay, I don't mind going. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, chime in, Peanut. Um, yeah, I guess I stopped work about 10 years ago. I wasn't supposed to retire. I was never intending to retire. Um, I certainly wasn't looking forward to any kind of retirement, being self-employed my whole life. Um, but I realized that there was something else I had to do, um, and that was to read. Um, to read extensively, to read the material that I thought I couldn't afford to read. Um, so mm, simple things like, what is the economy? I had to read why it exists. And, and uh, so in reading and watching YouTube and Netflix and any other resources that I could find, I actually wasted a whole lot of time just reading. And it felt like wasting time because I didn't have any objective or didn't have any real incentive to say that I was going to survive or I was going to pay the bills, all these other things, all these other pressures which are against me during this process, um, I, it made me want to do it even more. Um, and that's just the way I am. When I've been told I can't do something, I do it. Um, and that's been my whole life structure is to be, well, I don't think it's something that it's that difficult. It seems other people can do it. Why can't I? So that's always been my question. Why can't I? Um, and as far as employment is concerned, uh, I posted a little video the other day with someone carrying a ladder into a building and you can get into any building with a ladder. Um, so <laughs> generally that's how I approach life is just to go in the door and see what's up and say, whoops, I made a mistake, sorry. Or you say, mm, I'm curious. Um, so for me, it's always curiosity builds the engagement with other people. Um, and just to drop the fears and just to say, well, I'm a human and, and I don't feel I'm going to hurt anyone. And I just want to carry on my curiosity to what goes on. Is it, you know? And I've met other people too who just are intrinsically capable just to walk into any board meeting on the planet and figure out how it works and give them advice. Um, it's just fascinating when you can drop your fears and, and start to engage with people as a harmless individual. So for me, the largest hurdle we have in society is just fearing each other. That, uh, that felt inspiring to hear. Thank you um, for sharing that in that particular way. Um, when I entered the workforce, uh, like Albert, at the, at the height of the great financial crisis, I, I came in through the side door. I was dumb enough to major in English in college, which is just like, you want to succeed at game A, don't major in English. Um, but of course I didn't. I never really, I, I never felt this fear that I wouldn't succeed and I never felt any assurance that I would. It just felt irrelevant to try to game for that. It felt like I'm going to follow what I'm actually passionate to learn about. What am I curious about? I love literature. I love poetry. I'm going to major in taking in as much of that stuff as I can. And then people said things like, oh, so you want to teach? Or, oh, so you want to go to grad school? And I thought, yeah, probably not. So then I worked on a cruise ship um, as a musician um, and had just kind of an extension of my school experience, which was traveling around 
just like taking in the world, meeting people from all walks of life, from all places in their development, from all different you know, perspectives. And I, I felt like what that did for me most of all was like just yank all the filters off of my curiosity, make me want to get to know more of the world than more of people. So then following that, I just, I continued to follow my nose. I, I did what I was interested in doing. I, I, you know, would find ways to use my skills to pay the bills, but that was always kind of something on the side while I was growing in some way that I cared about. So I would always think of the job as like, just you know, a necessity and my off time as the place where I was really growing. And that continued for some years until I discovered what I was really interested in doing, which was teaching. I discovered that actually by working in retail and my retail job had me teaching people lessons like once a day, twice a day, I'd teach private lessons. And when I taught private lessons, I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. This is where, you know, I feel my skills come alive. So then I, I just continued to follow that. And when I got really tired of that workplace, I just quit my job and started working freelance as a tutor. And like tutoring people and things was really fun for me because I watch people grow. And one of my favorite things is just seeing people's like empowerment, seeing the lights come on when they notice how good they are at something or when, when they, you know, sort of level up in a skill and now they're ready to conquer a new level of their lives. And like, that's what turns me on. That's what makes me really happy to be part of that life. And so I, I followed that. Uh, and just in general, following curiosity never, never did me wrong. I, I wasn't tunning it. I, I didn't have tons of cash. Um, but I also, I really didn't have many years of hardship. I didn't really have any like struggle with in or out of the game. How well am I going to do at beating this game? I felt like I was winning the game I was playing, which was just getting to learn, getting to meet people who were learning, getting to be involved in people's growth. Um, and eventually that took me to the job that I have now, but all of it came through just following stuff for curiosity's sake. Now I, I get to do research on a full-time basis. And so I'm always learning now. I'm just like full-time learner is my job. And I plan to continue just following curiosity. It feels like that's my career. It's just do what I'm curious about. It probably won't net me millions of dollars. And I'm pretty glad that I don't have to like sacrifice that, you know, sense of my desire or inspiration in order to chase the money. I don't think I'd find the money as interesting. Like I'm not as curious about what I could do with a million dollars as I am about learning the things I'm learning today. So um, yeah, my big advice for people entering the game at this point in their lives is like, do what you're passionate about. That, that quote that's become a cliche that the world doesn't need more of your widgets. It needs more people who come alive. I, I believe it hundred percent. I think we need just living, you know, what is it? Live, uh, live players, not dead ones. Um, so yeah, I've always listened to that sort of advice of do what you're passionate about. But what I didn't realize was that my passion did not have to be something that was 18 hours a day. Like, because, because when I did the film major, I, I thought like I was going to be like a, a filmmaker, like quite often. And, and that I would sort of have to be the starving artist in order to make the films that I want. Um, but it also had to come to a decision where I wanted to do a job that I would find okay with and, and, and as gives me that stability. So that's why I've been switching to IT. And, and that does not seem to me to be a, a defeating kind of thing. It does not, um, it, it, it I become more pragmatic while still following what is alive for me, but I, I realized that I had to be in right relationship with with both of those things. So that was the sort of shift I had to make in order to get to the personal development that I needed for my life. It was because I had to run into that misconception of just do what you love and everything will follow, but it's it's not as easy as we think it is. And, and so I think of it more as, yeah, this being in right relationship. Chris, it sounds like maybe the, the right relationship for you, you is a little more of a both and of like, do what you love, but also do what is practical to some extent, such that you have that, like, like you said, that stability of a job that you know you can rely on, but also elements of what feels good to you. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, very much, yeah.
because definitely you can do a job that you're maybe not super passionate about, but it does really good for a lot of people. Like I think of IT and being able to contribute to digital infrastructure, which we're going to need to like really revamp that and for a, for a future world. So I would say that's part of my alignment and it's not, that's not necessarily the, the thing that I want to do the most, but it, 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 it does, it does feel satisfying in some regard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I resonate with all that and uh, thank you for all those amazing shares and now, and especially Rob, like now everything makes sense. English major, musician. And I'm like, Oh, that's why you're like, uh, you know, singing those high notes during uh what was it? Uh, rap on battle. So now it's starting to make sense there. Uh, so my personal thing was uh, my uh, degree in, uh, in university was, it was called technological entrepreneurship and management. It was like the nation's first like entrepreneurship program inside an engineering school. And the reason I picked that is because I knew I did not want to go down one path. It, was, it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to be like a doctor or a physical therapist or like a, you know, electrical engineer. It's like, no, like a technological, um, technological entrepreneurship and management is like whatever I, whatever passion I find in my life, I'm going to be able to use tech and entrepreneurship to turn that, you know, into something, you know, that, that trying to aligns whatever that, you know, I'm digging at the moment with something that could possibly, you know, quote unquote, earn me a living. Now the earn me a living thing is it's still troublesome. Like I, cause as I said before, like, because the consumption being egoistic and now you're also turning the production into egoistic, but let's be real. The world does need plumbers still. Okay. People still need to be, you know, electricians, you know, someone has to, you know, well, I was about to say someone needs to chop down the trees. Like, no, actually, we don't need people to chop down the trees right now. But you understand what I'm saying? Like, there is, you know, we're not at the point yet, though. I think that, you know, maybe we could talk about this. We're not at the point we're at fully automated luxury communism yet. Uh, but, you know, st like still like the whole point of this, is like, you know, to get in right relationship with productivity and, and self-improvement and also like doing what you feel, doing what you that you really that what makes you feel alive. So, yeah. So it's like aligning it but there are certain there are different ways that we could align it integrate it come at it and i actually already see it already um from everyone here uh so adam you haven't shared your story uh would you like to go ahead and share yours oh, how you feel about uh the relationship between the two i'll briefly jump in with my own story it's it's somewhat similar to rob's except it's much more cynical and pessimistic but i think that's just maybe a, a personality trait i have but I, I learned about Descent from kind of the system in Game A at large uh, around the age of 17. And when I went to university afterwards, I, I really struggled to participate in that, that kind of formal education setting. I didn't, it wasn't giving me what I wanted. And so I left and tried to go back a few times, but have more or less been pursuing my passion since then, which is music. And, you know, throughout my 20s, there's a large, large chunks of time beyond just spiritual and existential dread where, where I was relying on my relationship partner to meet my basic needs as far as the food on the table and roof over my head. And that, that dependence on somebody who was fully participating in game A whilst I was kind of rejecting it didn't, didn't make me feel good. It didn't didn't sit with me well, so there is some kind of need for pragmatism there, and and to make sure you are self sufficient. And by you kind of participating in at least uh, your spiritual game B life, that you you aren't uh, taking too much or taking advantage of others who do have to go and do plumbing every day or or the electrician work. So there has to be some happy middle ground there, is what I'd say. There's a question I kind of feel arising here, which is along the lines of like, if there is such work as plumbing and and uh, a lot of other menial labor in society, like, is that something that anybody actually feels particularly drawn to do? Or is it something that, you know, just needs to be done? And if that is so, then is it possible for every single individual to live in a way that feels aligned with what they actually feel drawn to do? Or does there need to be some structure to society wherein maybe that kind of labor is 
collectively sourced. Everybody takes a turn doing that kind of thing. You know, you like learn enough to be dangerous and then you can fix the pipes for someone's house or whatever. I don't know. I don't know if we should collectively source plumbing, but it does seem to me like there is this kind of layer, this like bottom layer of labor that probably no one really wants to do. But if we want to live in such a way that we're all aligned with what feels right to us and what we really feel drawn to do, how do we balance, like Adam was saying, that kind of necessary pragmatic layer to things? I want to jump in with just one, an extra anecdote. Uh, so I, you know, in my very early 20s, I did have a couple jobs. One of them was fire department and I was working as a firefighter and I was proficient enough at the job and, and it did feel rewarding the work I was doing and helping people, but it just wasn't ultimately the right fit for me. And after I left that, I, I also tr transitioned into a retail job for a little while. And the job itself wasn't spiritually or intellectually rewarding, but at the same time, I, I noticed my complaints weren't the same as what most of my coworkers were complaining about. Most coworkers complain about the customers and dealing with annoying customers all day. My complaint was more about the management and the system and the way it was set up itself. So I feel like there, there is a way in, in the game B kind of world, with whatever that marketplace looks like eventually, where I wouldn't mind stocking shelves or helping customers find goods or whatever that ratio is, because I got along really well with the customers, I had regulars who would sometimes buy me lunch or Christmas or birthday cards. The system itself seems to be a struggle for a lot of people. And I wonder if it's just the same kind of what we consider menial work is framed differently if that becomes more appealing to people, if it's if it's functions differently or if it's reframed in a in a in a better setting. Yeah, I'm gonna plus one Adam there and and I think it has to do a lot with administration and bureaucracy. Like really how they sort of like chunk down everything and how they sort of become um like silos management. Um, that does not work for people. It does not trinkle the sort of gains that you would see a company go all the way down. So I, I think we sort of see like a movement towards like worker owned cooperatives um, that do give the workers some more dignity. And I really liked Eduardo's piece on dignity um, if, you, if you've seen it in the discord, but I, I think dignity is sort of that, that key that I think you're touching upon Adam. And so I'm, I'm grateful for you to bring that up. Yeah, I like where this thread is going, and I just want to tag on a, a thing that a friend of, I, of mine and I were talking about uh, pretty recently, where we just were remarking on what a hard job it must be to be a janitor. I, I haven't ever been a janitor, but I imagine that just the unpleasantness of the job would would make it pretty difficult to stomach, and that in a more equitable world, janitors would hold a station of, like, you know, social recognition and of, like, pretty stupendous gain when it came to their salary because who isn't grateful that their toilet is clean <laughs> who isn't grateful that the floor is walkable you know like the fact that we don't necessarily recognize the people that that hold these jobs um, says more about like the way that, the, that our relationships function than about the value of those jobs so might we want to do something then like okay we're here talking about how do we want to reframe our relationship to productivity and self-development in game b what is our, you know, what's the present game A way of relating to that layer of menial labor and how could we reframe it? And I think plus one what Chris D said about having dignity is kind of like a baseline assumption for all people. Um, I started to read that article and I, there was something in here. He's, he's, he asked you to do like a thought experiment where it was like, if, if you assumed that every individual had like dignified access to, you know, every layer of needs that uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, then, you know, our structures would need to change radically to provide, you know, dignified access to water, air, food for everybody to provide dignified access to psychological safety for everybody. What would it look like to create a dignified relationship to plumbing, to janitorial work? What would a, what would a society that appreciated those things and actually embodied an outwards expression of those appreciate of that appreciation look like? You know, could we recondition ourselves to relate to those those positions in society in a way that was that showed how much we appreciate and respect that work because I agree I think I think we all like that our toilets are clean and that the floor is clean and that there's people doing those things but we don't ever thank them or at least I don't think a lot of people do 
Yeah, and uh, especially with COVID happening, uh, what's the new, well, maybe not the neologism, but what became really popular, essential worker. Those are the essential workers, right? This is why it's like, oh, these people need to be here doing this. Wait a minute, I don't have to be doing that. I don't, not only do I not have to be doing this, a lot of people are starting to wake up, wait a minute, my job should not exist. Talk about Dave Graber's bullshit job. Like I, I work a bullshit job. These people work bullshit jobs. And I think that hopefully maybe that gets the ball rolling a little bit, but yeah, I mean, that's really um, an interesting question. How do we, how do we, you know, reframe this? Like, you know, it has to start, you know, from the bottom up from, you know, the, the, the locally. And I'm just trying to figure out like, and like, again, like I plus one, what everyone has been saying, like the dignity and the relation with, even though that we, even though we call it menial, it's like, it's, a, it's essential. And, um, and it's just like, again, like uh, an, an alternative socioeconomic system would pay not people, uh, would pay people not by how much capital they're able to extract, but you know, one way would be like how much value it provides, but also it's like, how much do I not want to do the job? All right. So I have a question, right? If everyone here was going to be paid the same wage, $60,000 a year, right? And you had to be either a janitor or like a computer programmer, right? I mean, which one would you choose? I mean, you would actually probably want to be a computer programmer. So you would have to be, in order to be a janitor, you would have to pay the janitor more than the computer programmer because this makes you feel more alive. Like this is like, this is less stressful. This is more enjoyable. So like, that's another way of uh, reframing things. And, but here's the thing, this, then, then, then there's the other um, aspect coming in is like the, autom the, the automation aspect. Because uh, one of the things that capitalism is doing, right? Like, I don't know if I want to say it's a good thing, but one of the forces it has is because you want to have uh, as cheap uh, pr as a production as possible a after wages get to a certain point, after the way the worker demands too much, you're like, okay, let's just start automating everything. And that's, the thing. that's not a bad thing either. The problem is the, the dynamic of it's because that you don't want to pay workers anything. So that's why before I brought up fully automated luxury communism, you know, it may get to the point where, okay, we can have the automation and then people will be able to, you know, pursue what they want to do. If they have to do something they don't want to do, such as cleaning a toilet, even though that may be automated at the point, you know, something of that uh, to that effect, they would be quote unquote paid more maybe. So I'm just, I'm very interested exactly in, uh, in exploring how we could get to any of these uh, realms. So now that you bring up the argument of automation, it then brings up the argument that the skills gap has to be um, shrunk. It, it, the skills gap has, there, people have to be more skilled at things because if you're, because if you're gonna compare the software programmer to the janitor, um, the software programmer has to go for a lot more education to do their job rather than um, the education it needs to like move a mob. So there is definitely that aspect of skill and expertise. And so the market rewards you for your skill and expertise. How that relates to dignity, it, it should be that, that still, that even though you're not as skilled, that you still have some sort of... Um, living so that's why ubi is becoming more of a popularity of a policy choice i'm going to stop there for a moment but yeah there, there's a sort of there's sort of that, that, that dynamic of play of like skill and being paid to the proportion of what you're skilled at yeah and i just want to jump in yeah and then um uh, this is one of the things that they talk about a lot in game b is having those tight feedback loops right one way to quote unquote get paid that, you know how much you get paid is how much value you're bringing in and a thing is like, cause it's also like, okay, it takes a lot of skill to be a computer programmer. It also takes a lot of skill to be like a wall street quant, but, <laughs> but it's also like, do we want that? So that there's another thing. So like, there's dignity, um, there's skill, there's demand, there's value and, and who, how do we derive value? Who gets to say what's valuable and how do we, you know, embed that into the system? And that, that's, that's another aspect we could bring into it. Yeah, so getting a new metric for a certain kind of value for people doing things that just make you feel good, that might be the sort of value that we are looking into and sort of sort of the communities that are formed are get, offering this sort of value, but it doesn't really seem to be like a sort of 
gamification or commoditization of skill rather, but rather as something more of a congregation for its own sake. Okay, right. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, anyone else have any thoughts about like, like maybe another aspect we could bring to this? Like, like, you know, because what do we have so far? We have skill, we have value, uh, we have dignity. Uh, anyone else have any thoughts? Uh, Adam, David, Rob, or Peanut? <laughs> Well, I can't say that I know how to fit my head around the question. I could say we do want to have a system where we reward people for like the long-term development of skills and for specialization of education. That's awesome. I love to see that investment get rewarded. And on the other hand, I want to see like gratitude built into more of our direct relationships. I don't want to never see the face of the person who picks up my garbage for me. That's like such an act of service that I want to be able to thank them directly. Why don't we hold those relationships with people? Well, because like we've got a, a mechanistic system that treats people more like replaceable parts. And so like there's a different person that picks up my trash every morning. And similarly, it, it feels like the relationships that used to be cultivated between even just like the educators and the students, it has been eroded. Um, it's not just the people who do menial tasks, but it's, it's like, I think all tasks become more menial when they're extracted from relationship. Um, you know, I've, I've been a teacher to students before who barely knew me. And those were really unsatisfying teacherly relationships. I, I didn't feel like the act that I made on them could have ever been very strong. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe somebody took some real inspiration from that class experience. But I know that for me, as, a, like, as an educator, the most meaningful times that I've contributed my gift have been times where I actually got to see long-term change. And it happened only through having a long-term relationship with that student and their family and knowing what the story was for everyone involved. So I imagine a lot of menial tasks that people think of as just, I don't know, schlocky, uh, like bottom of the pile kind of jobs would have a whole lot more inherent dignity if they were really in relationship. And a lot of the things that we think of as bullshit jobs probably wouldn't really exist if they had to exist in relationship. I, I think that they would show to not be all that valid or valuable um, if they were brought into that light. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of questioning myself on that last one. I could be wrong. Yeah, I mean, awesome. I mean, thank you so much, Rob. And like, yeah, it's this, you know, it's like, and it, like, it's this recurring theme, like, how do we retain like these, these, these deep personal relationships, you know, these deep embodied relationships and it just keeps going back to local, 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 local. And it just, it's, just, it's so difficult in this, you know, this, you know, expanding globalized world. And then just like, how do we do that? I mean, like, yeah, but I mean, yeah, that's another thing that, you know, we're going to continue to explore. That's, you know, that's it for a session. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Adam, David, Rob, and Peanut. I won't reveal your name, you know, because <laughs> you're a secret agent. And Chris for facilitating and for writing your awesome article on being in right relationship with productivity and personal development. Uh, I mean, we went through a lot today, explored, you know, what, it, what it means to be in right relationship, our personal stories. I hope that, you know, everyone got something out of that. And I definitely got something out of that. Uh, so Chris, do you have any closing statements before we go? Thanks for having me on. And, and thank you for uh, all of us to get down and dirty on the ground sense making. I think this is, this is the sort of conversation that we kind of need right now. All right, can I finish with one statement? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Peanut. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's the um, we just touched on the Dunbar philosophy there. It's it, the cleaner is part of our Dunbar our crowd. Um, if they're cleaning the toilet, they're they're part of somebody we we can love, um, and that's how I see it. Is how that's how we build community is by being curious to what everybody does and not to judge them on the activity that they do, but to see who they are as a human. All right. Beautiful send off peanuts. And uh, that's it, everyone. Again, thanks so much for coming. And this is going to go up on the Noic Nomads channel. I really think that people are going to get a lot out of this conversation. Uh, feel free to continue it in the comments. Uh, perhaps this will be a series. Perhaps we'll have different sessions. Who knows? I have no idea what's going on. All I know is that I'm very excited about it. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Again, goodbye. Peace out. All right.